Uh, my name is Blair Chintella. I'm an attorney. I live and I work in the Atlanta metropolitan area. Um, I practice a general practice law firm, but I also, uh, on the side, focus on civil liberties issues and digital rights. So. My name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the U.S. Policy Manager and Global Policy Council at Access Now, which is an international civil society organization um, with a mission to extend and defend the digital rights of users at risk around the world. So we work at the intersection of human rights and technology. And today we are both here to talk about Propaganda 101. Um, and to give a brief introduction, you guys might know um, kind of traditional types of propaganda. Um, but as we move into the internet, it's kind of coming forth and new issues are coming forth in different ways. And so there are three different topics really in the, in the, under the umbrella of propaganda. Um, the first is known as counter speech. And that is kind of the traditional propaganda that you're all aware of where the government puts out um, speech that is either identified as government speech or not identified um, and is trying to counter a specific message out into the world. Um, however, there's also um, profiling that happens under the auspice of propaganda so they can figure out who to target. Um, they are trying to take in a lot of information that's potentially publicly available, Twitter posts, Facebook posts, and determine who might be a target for propaganda and who might act in a way that they need um, to be messaged to. And the third, third type is takedowns. And this can be content takedowns, removing a tweet, um, or a Facebook post or full profile takedowns of messages that governments don't want the public to see or um, and sometimes very legitimately um, things like harassment things like sexual um, abuse photos or terrorist content um, but it's often done with not a lot of transparency and so there becomes a lot of issues that go along with it and so I wanted to introduce this topic um, with a, with a piece from an NPR blog or an NPR podcast called The Poetry of Propaganda. Have, has anybody here heard this? Po this? So it's a wonderful piece. I highly recommend it um, to anybody who's at all interested in these issues. And it walks through three or four different stories about different ways um, that propaganda exists in the real world. Um, but one of them is called, the segment is called The Spy Who Didn't Know She Was a Spy. And basically it talks about a woman by the name of Marion Leary um, who had supported clean water and really thought clean water was important and so the government accountability office had ruled that in social media there's new ways that federal agencies can mess up on propaganda rules there are really strong propaganda rules in the United States and the Environmental Protection Agency had sent out a campaign where they went on social media and they told the world okay we're proposing a new rule to keep pollution out of drinking water and that part was okay. But then they said, if you like our proposed rule, send out a tweet and here is what the tweet could say. And the wording suggested exactly what people should say on Twitter in order to support drinking, clean drinking water. And this is what people do in Twitter campaigns all the time. Everybody does this. And that way you get a tweet storm and everybody is saying the same thing. Um, but the, the GAO actually compared it to the, if the EPA had paid somebody to appear on television and support their point of view without saying that they had paid the person and saying that the person was speaking in their own capacity. And they said this was a violation of the propaganda rules and they issued huge fines against the EPA for engaging in this campaign. And so it's this really weird interaction where you think this was a totally okay thing, this person tweeted on their own, they supported this issue, they were okay with the message. However, in the eyes of the government, this was propaganda. The EPA was putting words in people's mouths and making people government mouthpieces. And so that's kind of an interesting story to start with. Um, I know, Blair, you wanted to bring up a couple issues around. Do you want to go ahead with um, companies? <clears throat> yeah, my, I think in my mind, propaganda also involves stuff like uh, people editing Wikipedia, which is basically if you don't know what Wikipedia is, you've been living in a cave for the last 15 years, then uh, <clears throat> people contribute uh, information to this site and on a wide variety of topics. And about uh, 10 years ago, uh, Wikipedia, well, let me back up. First, Wikipedia has a policy that people who contribute information aren't supposed to have a conflict of interest. Um, so the way they police that is they look at the IP addresses who are making these changes. And they essentially have people who are curating and reviewing the stuff that's made on Wikipedia, the changes. Um, 
but it came out about 10 years ago that a lot of IP addresses from the, the Congress and the Senate were making changes to their respective legislative leaders' web pages. So they're basically removing all the negative things, adding the fluff and the positive things. And if, a, for example, if someone came out and was going to campaign again, but they had already said that they were only going to run for two terms and they would, re would remove that to make them look better. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff like that is very, very subtle and you're really not going to notice it. So um, just goes to show when you go to Wikipedia, there's, there could be some misinformation uh, on there. Uh, Wikipedia in response, uh, it got to a point where they actually banned all IP addresses from the Congress for a period of a week uh, until they sorted out what they should do. Uh, then they let them come back. And sort of the, the response from other people has been uh, one person created a Twitter account that will actually tweet every time a congressional IP address modifies something on Wikipedia. <laughs> So, and then they do the same thing, and they have the same, th in all fairness, they have the same thing for the Russian government. So they caught the Russian government modifying a slew of things on Wikipedia, and it just happens thousands and thousands of times, and uh, Wikipedia actually has a, a blog of every time that they ban an IP address. So they have a list of, and sort of like a wall of shame, so to speak, <laughs> of people who are getting banned for, you know, doing propaganda on Wikipedia. So, you know, if you're reading a Wikipedia article, you should be very skeptical or somewhat skeptical about it, as you should with anything online, really. So, um. And if at any point you guys have questions, please feel free. It's early in the morning. Well, it's not early in the morning. It's almost <laughs> afternoon <laughs> on the last day. Um, so we're going to be more interactive and, and look more casual. So if you guys have questions, we have the box up here, um, and we're happy to, to interact. Um, one of the areas, in fact, probably the area where you hear propaganda coming up most frequently today is an area called countering violent extremism. Has anybody heard of this? CVE? The acronym CVE is also used on government hacking issues, so it's really confusing sometimes to talk about which CVE you're referring to. Um, CVE was a topic that was raised when the government realized that First of all, violent extremism is supposed to be broader than terrorism. It's supposed to be any type of violent activity conducted, regardless of whether or not it's terrorism. And the government realized that, specifically with ISIS, that terrorist groups were increasingly moving to the internet to conduct recruitment and to try to get people to either come and train to be a terrorist or to conduct violent acts in their own capacity. And so they have instituted a bunch of programs to try to figure out who is being targeted by these programs, who is susceptible, susceptible to these programs, and how they can basically switch back the narrative to prevent this type of recruitment from happening. And this is actually a real problem. Like, in a lot of ways, we see that when government does bad things, they do it in response to something that is a real threat, a real problem, and then they just act in ways that are really overbroad and encompass way too much speech. Um, and so what CVE programs have actually become are a front for very racist programs that target a very specific community, um, either in the US or around the world, and often look to dissuade any sort of controversial speech from occurring. Um, so by way of example, the FBI has a website on the internet right now called Don't Be a Puppet. And you can access this website. And actually, you can get a, a certificate if you complete the Don't Be a Puppet program, which I have hanging on my wall. <laughs> um, and what the Don't Be a Pro Puppet program is trying to do is it's aimed at children. And it's trying to get school-age children to recognize when they are being convinced to do something bad. Um, but I think one of the frames of this program is people who speak out against the government. And so they are teaching a lot of children that if you speak out against the government, that you could be a terrorist and that they have to report these people. Um, and so again, it's very, very overbroad. The programs um, kind of encompass a lot of legitimate speech. And they're again, aimed at very specific minority communities and trying to get those specific communities to scared and um, unwilling to speak up and unwilling to say things that might be considered um, as not constructive. And so, again, coming back to my three pieces, counter speech, they want to take the narratives that are being produced on the internet in support of 
violent extremism and switch them on their heads. Try to say why you shouldn't conduct terror attacks. And this is largely not a big deal. You want, again, the propaganda rules to apply. You want transparency. You want people to know when the government is issuing this speech. Um, but a lot of times when you come out with rules, laws that um, try to violate speech or when there's bad speech in the world, we often say the solution is more speech. If somebody is saying something you don't like, you want to counter that. You don't want to necessarily censor them. You don't want to shut them down. You want to provide more speech into the world and add to the marketplace of ideas. And so this is not, this is, um, there's an issue with how it's deployed, but it's by far not the most harmful thing that governments are doing. Um, those things are in the other two programs, the profiling and the takedowns. And so right now, if you go to Twitter or Facebook and you look at their transparency reports, you will see how many times the government has asked them to take down content and under vaguely under what authorities. And they publish this, and in the US they're allowed to publish this, and they're actually encouraged to do so. Um, what you won't see are how many times governments say to them, this content violates your terms of service. We just want to flag this for you so that you can take it down in your own right. We're not going to order you to take it down, but you know it shouldn't be on your profile platform anyway. Please take it down. And that this is an inc something activity that we found is increasingly incurring, especially in Europe, is governments are trying to look at this content, decide what they want taken down, and rather than go through formal legal channels that are reported, they're just saying, hey, Twitter, hey, Facebook, please take this down on your own right, and none of that is reported. The other thing that they're doing is this profiling. Um, they are trying to, they think that they can find an algorithm that will identify who is going to be a terrorist. Um, and they want to put all of their information into big databases and run analysis over it to see if they can figure out a way to determine what people say and how people interact that predicts if they're going to conduct violent activity. And the model that they often use for this is a child pornography model. So every time essentially, and this I'm talking on a, a level up here on the technology, so there are exceptions and there are nuances. But basically every time you clone a file, that file has a fingerprint and it's identical. And so for child, when they go out to find child pornography, they can run analysis and if they're looking for these fingerprints, they're going to match documents that they know to have child pornography because they will be replicated from them. So they can kind of do this analysis and they can conduct it matching pieces and pull that stuff down and flag the right people who are sharing these files. They think that they can do the same thing and find fingerprints for terrorist content and determine who is sharing terrorist content. The problem is, is there are a lot of legitimate reasons to share terrorist content. Um, researchers do it all the time. People who are trying to figure out what is going on in the world. If you're reading newspapers, a lot of times journalists will cite to this so you can go in and out and see this. So it's not necessarily in the same world as child pornography, but they really are trying hard to import that model into a model where it doesn't fit. Um, so those are the, the three major ways we're seeing CVE really guide the, the discussion on propaganda and on what is allowed and what isn't allowed, and the way that governments are trying to get around the rules to um, influence companies and influence um, public debate. Uh, yeah, I would add, just add to that that um, Facebook and Twitter will sometimes delete or suspend accounts just of their own volition because something violates the terms of service. So it's not necessarily prompted by the government or, or whatnot, but um, it's very sketchy because a lot of the stuff they delete is just opinion about a terrorist act or something, or it's a political, uh, for example, Facebook deleted a bunch of accounts that were talking about marijuana dispensaries. And so they kind of took the position that, that that violated their terms of service. And so they removed them all. And you know, have, you have millions and millions of followers on those websites that could destroy someone's business. Um, and it happens for political ideas as well. Um, regarding the, uh, the takedowns, uh, I'd like to you know, at least mention China. They're sort of notorious about their great firewall. So they're really, skilled at um, uh, censoring and they have a, basically a state news agency that can regulate what's posted online so uh, I just want to play a real short clip if it'll play
uh, the likes of Tencent, Sina, from creating or having their own original news service. So what they can do it, is take the content from state-controlled news uh, orgs uh, and take that and report that. Now, just have a look at some of the reaction that we're seeing right now. So uh, we're browsing through a few in Weibo here, and Sina Weibo is the first one here. So it's, it's better to just shut down, one user says, those media outlets who aren't truthful and objective in the reporting and only care about making headlines. Next one uh, says, you know, we still need the news, but what's the point then of having the internet if, if this happens? Another one says, ooh, are you afraid of the internet? Admin control, of course, something that uh, Beijing is known for. This is terrible. Uh, now, very quickly, this one, last one here, speechless. It seems that the rule now is to remain silent. So no words, I think, is, is some of the reaction that we have. There's always going to be a way of getting uh, your view out, though, isn't there? That's the thing. Uh, there certainly is. Uh, you can... It, I guess we have a Twitter, in fact. We have a Twitter reaction basically saying, you know, how can you actually control, uh, you know, uh, over half a million or billion users who actually make their way outside China and talk about these other yeah. things as well. So China, there are plenty of examples on the, on the Internet you can read about, uh, about China doing this sort of thing. And one of their responses to the, when the story broke is, quote, Mainstream news portals and big commercial websites should play an exemplary role in strengthening management, developing healthy trends, pooling positive energy, and contributing to the Chinese dream. So <laughs> that's fine and dandy if you, if you agree with the Chinese dream, but it sort of runs inimical to our model here in the United States, I would hope, about having a free and open debate. Um, I believe that touches on one of your points mm -hmm. as far as censorship. So censorship is very closely related to propaganda, um, in my mind. And China is basically, you've, you've all heard of the Great Firewall of China. Well, they've heard of the, they've coined another term called the Great Golden Shield, which is basically the government regulating what news agencies can report on. So um, we don't want to go down that road, um, but that's obvious, so. <laughs> and then the, the major piece, the final major piece to bring up before I'm going to like start edging you guys to participate, fair warning, um, is how this actually interacts with the encryption debate. So how many people were here earlier this weekend and heard the, the panel on encryption? And the, no? We got, we got one. Uh, um, so a lot of times the there is an increasing narrative that terrorists and that people who are conducting violent acts are using encrypted tools, um, encrypted messaging um, applications, or encrypted devices like iPhones in order to plan and carry out these activities. Um, and so the government, of course, wants to get access to those communications and so that they can determine where the attacks are going to occur. And so they want the, this eye in to where people who they think are high priority targets are communicating, which is great. And we actually want them to pay attention to the targets. But their way to get that in has been to undermine the security and the encryption that everybody uses in order to ensure that they are able to see certain information or documentation. And they want to use that information to frame, again, coming back to their counter speech, to frame those debates, to frame those um, messages that they are sending out in the world so that they can adequately target kind of all populations who might be willing to conduct terrorist acts um, so that they can see where, to, where geographically to target and where community-wise to target their messaging. And so everything kind of interrelates to each other. We're starting to see this web where terrorism kind of plays the, the utmost justification role. Like, regardless of what they want to do, here's the little terrorism cloud that they float over it. And then you filter down and you're like, they want, they want to see all of the content, so they need to undermine encryption, they need to be watching and analyzing all public social media profiles. They want to respond to it, so they need the ability to publish more information um, and potentially to do so maybe without the adequate means of transparency. And then they want to be able to profile all of you and determine which of you might be next to commit a terrorist attack so that they can target their investigations as well. And so these are their kind of their general walk through the propaganda world um, or their censorship world. In China, one thing China's, <laughs> I keep harping on China, but uh, 
<laughs> I actually admire a lot of their culture, but it's their government I have a lot of problems with. Uh, but they've actually come out with like a consumer credit rating. So one of the, some of the factors there involve like how obedient you are to the government's message. And so that will actually affect, you know, your credit rating in society. So uh, that's essentially propaganda in my mind. Um, it's hard to imagine that happening. But in a lot of ways, what you post online, your, you know, your employers can go out and read about it. Um, stuff like that you're judged on. So you have to be careful when you go and do that. Uh, but the, when the government has the ability to censor that kind of stuff, it's, it's very uh, critical. We need to fight against that. So. Um, Can we get the, the box? Yeah, any questions? We got one. We got yeah. three. Right here. And then oh, two over here. You just talk into it. It's a microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, we talked. Up. Oh, my question is, we've talked a lot about China, but I've been hearing a lot about how Russia has been also controlling a lot of the media outlets and some of the stuff like that. Do you have? I was just curious about uh, a lot of your opinions to do with Russia and the kind of propaganda. Like I know they do a lot of Keller, you know, putting out a lot of. Uh, news uh, articles that are stating the propaganda, but what else are they doing? Like, I'm just kind of curious. So one of the big things that we've seen come out of Russia lately, they just passed a new law. I um, mean, a lot of the major companies are trying to figure out how they're going to react to this. Um, because one of the things that they have tried to do is what we call mandatory data localization. And so any company that does business in Russia, they want to have a presence in Russia. And that is so that they can exert jurisdiction over all of these companies, so that they can do things like get to the information of supposedly Russian citizens, but they would be able to get to the information of everybody um, so that they can bring companies into court when they are not abiding by laws, um, so that they have a physical person or a physical space. And that is a space not only necessarily into Russian data, but into kind of you use the Russian headquarters as a bouncing off point to get into all of the other data centers run by the company. And so Russia um, is taking some extreme steps right now to make sure it can exert control over major company data. Um, and they're, they're not the only ones. Data localization proposals are really popping up all over the world, um, and we're seeing them in various different countries. Um, and they have come up with a lot of different justifications for these. One of them has been, we need to be able to get to terrorist communications. Um, a very popular one a couple years ago in the wake of the Snowden revelations was we want to make sure the U.S. can't conduct surveillance over our own citizens, so we're going to keep our citizens' data in our own country. Basically, except when you have to do it. it actually, the funny thing about that argument is rules on the NSA, the U.S. NSA, for conduct collecting information outside of the United States of foreigners are much less rigorous than rules for them collecting information in the United States. Uh, so they were actually making, their, they were saying they wanted to make surveillance harder, but under US law they were actually making it a whole lot easier for the NSA to get to that data. But what they really want is this control. They want control over all the major companies and they want to be able to either force them to do what they want to do, to turn over the information they want and to continue to exercise their very repressive laws against these providers. Uh, this is in reference to uh, takedowns. I, I don't know if I'm using the box correctly. Um, so the First Amendment is great. And there's always a but. Uh, but it's <laughs> obviously, uh, it only works in reference to state action. Um, Twitter and Facebook, for that matter, care very much about intellectual property. Uh, they'll delete your NFL gifts, they'll delete your Olympic mm -hmm. gifts. How do we as end users get them to care as much about speech as they do intellectual property? That is the question, I will say, um, and it's Speed incredibly question. important. Um, you see, um, I mean, primarily women, but people on Twitter all the time getting harassed, getting called out. Um, some of the messages that I've seen targeted toward people at Twitter, um, like barrages of messages, not single messages, I, 
I have very few words for them because they are so horrific. Um, they have involved severing of limbs, raping in various orifices, um, stalking, tracking, standing outside people's houses, and people receive hundreds of thousands of these sometimes in a single day um, if they are at the top of whatever Twitter mob is working at the moment. And it's really hard to get Twitter to take those messages down. But as you identify, if you posted a GIF of the Olympics, it would come down really quickly. Um, and so people are trying to figure out how to respond to this. Um, Twitter itself is trying to figure out how to respond to this, to be fair, um, because you have the NBC machine working behind the IP takedowns, and you have this whole kind of company backing to make sure that every single one of those gets flagged for removal. But how do you have one person trying to stand against you know, these hundreds of thousands of harassing tweets? It's, not this, it's hard to keep up. And police don't yet know how to deal with this. In fact, I received an email once um, vaguely threatening about an event I was speaking at in New York. I live in DC. Um, I called the DC police and I wanted to be like, I don't know what to do with this, but I wanted to give you a heads up that this is a thing and it happened. And they were like, this isn't our jurisdiction. Like, leave us alone. We don't want to know about this. Um, and I actually had to call up to New York, who also told me, because I received the email in DC, that it was not their jurisdiction, and they didn't know what to do about it. So cops are also woefully behind in having to deal, in how to deal with technology issues. Um, and the platforms are really striving to keep up. I know Blair has a blog post from Twitter on their CVE updates. Um, they just prov um, publish an update to that where they say that daily suspensions are up over 80% from last year with spikes in suspensions immediately following terrorist attacks. So they are trying to figure out how to look at these accounts that are popping up, um, either harassing accounts or accounts in the wake of attacks, and to target those as well as they do the IP accounts, but I don't think we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, I would just add to that that it, it, it varies from company to company. Some companies actually care about free speech, and other ones are just out there to make a quick, a quick buck. So if you run across that issue, I would, I would gravitate towards the companies that actually do care. And some actually do. I mean, Twitter has been fairly good. Facebook's been OK. Um, but I mean, if you come across a situation, I would switch providers or whatnot. Um, but it's just so hard because Twitter is so huge now. And it's like switching email providers to an encrypted one. You know, you're, it's, it's really hard to change that mindset. But once they start losing customers because of these issues, then um, they'll start changing. And there has been some pushback. You know, like Apple's a good example. They've actually stood up for people's privacy and rights. Um, so, you know, you know, vote by buying their products, you know, supporting them. So. so Apple certainly hasn't stood up for free speech with their uh, app store um, I don't know the details of that. I know that they were blocked in China for their purchases recently. Again, China. But uh, <laughs> Apple um, tends to to excite strong feelings on several different sides of the aisle between yeah. um, <laughs> being a closed source. I know the people who true, love open true. source software are very anti Apple. People who love encryption tend to, you know, are pro Apple. People who they have different messages. They stand up for different things, and it depends on which part of that yeah. you feel the most strongly about. Yeah, Apple's not a nonprofit, so <laughs> <laughs> and they're huge, right? But so if you vote with your money, then it'll, you can have an income on or effect in that way. So uh, yeah. Another question. One. Um, okay, so this is kind of getting back into um, what she asked about Russia in relation to what she had mentioned about China. So um, I recently recently had the pleasure of marrying into a very massive Turkish family, and I don't. <laughs> I was wondering if Turkey was going to get brought up. <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't know. Maybe some folks here have uh, dealt with the U.S. immigration process, but one of the things you might end up doing if you get involved in that is reading constantly about the politics of the country you know your spouse is coming from because you're always wondering if they're going to get denied access and you know that kind of mm -hmm. stuff um, and one of the things that I read about a lot it was uh, your Turkey is actually I think the most uh, has the most takedown requests at least with respect to Twitter mm -hmm. even more than Russia or China uh, at least that's that's what I remember reading 
And you, but you mentioned something that I didn't know about, that now there's this kind of back channel takedown where they're saying, oh, you know, by the way, this is actually against your policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, is there, is there like some kind of statistics on that? So if it's, we know the official number, but of, of where they do it the, I guess the, you know, correct way. Mm -hmm. Is there like five times as many, you know, unofficial or, or I don't know, I was just curious about that. So in, in conversations, we are hearing that they are, that those numbers are smaller but growing. Um, so this is a tool that is increasingly used. Again, it is largely used in Europe. You're seeing a lot of terms of service flags um, in the EU and from EU countries. Um, so we are putting pressure on companies to start reporting these as well, and they have been receptive to the idea. So we hope to get the terms of service flags from government included in future transparency reports. Um, Access Now actually keeps what we call a transparency reporting index. So if any of you are ever interested in how, what companies you deal with and how many times they respond to government requests for your information, um, feel free to wander over to the Transparency Reporting Index, look up the company, and you can see their transparency report um, and how they are dealing with government requests. And we hope that Terms of Service flags will be on there. Twitter, or Turkey, is actually, because you brought up Turkey and Twitter, infamous for just taking Twitter down. They will shut Twitter down so it doesn't work throughout the entire country. And that uh, That's actually happened twice when I've been there. Yeah. Like, just wow. suddenly couldn't access. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's that, happened that was because coup, of WikiLeaks, yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. A few days after the coup, the WikiLeaks released. Um, they called it emails from the party, but it really wasn't. But just as a, pre a precautionary majority. measure, they just shut it down. So I don't know exactly how they do it technically, but you couldn't access Twitter. Um, they go to the providers and yeah. shut. They order the providers to shut down access to websites. And they'll, you'll see that. You see it in Turkey. You see it in Brazil. Brazil has now shut down WhatsApp several times. I actually said, you know, we need a tally system to figure out how many times Turkey has shut down Twitter and how many times Brazil has shut down WhatsApp to see which country is ahead at various points in time. <laughs> um, shutdowns are, are so, so common. Um, either shutdowns of specific websites or shutdowns of the entire internet at times. Um, there was an African country recently that shut down the internet, I kid you not, because children were taking a standardized test. And so that justified shutting down the entire internet. Um, this is their justification. Um, and I think they did it twice. I think this was the second time they've done that. And Google, so in 2002, Google was shut down in China, again, China, but <laughs> uh, for nine days, then YouTube was blocked after unrest in Tibet in 2008, and then Facebook and Twitter were shut down after riots in Xinjiang, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, in 2009. So they have a very tight grip on, they can shut down specific sites and all access to, to specific sites. But I mean, on the positive side, there are a lot of technologies out there that, that people are developing, uh, proxies, VPNs, uh, Tor network, stuff like that. I know Amy's uh, organization works a lot with that too, so. Mm -hmm. If I recall correctly, during the, um, the revolution in Egypt back in uh, 2011, the government also tried to shut down Facebook and Twitter, and immediately mm -hmm. folks around um, the Middle East, North Africa, as well as Europe and America were like, use this, use yeah. this workaround. Um, and in fact, people were calling it the Facebook revolution, and there were reports of people naming their children Facebook and Twitter <laughs> in the wake after that revolution, which sadly has not panned out quite as optimistically as the people of that country had hoped. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was very much, um, if, if as yeah. I'm sure we all are, being that we're all on this panel, um, interested in like all the technology um, issues yeah. of how people use this to either uh, work against government support or how the government uses it to try to shut down unrest was very much that was that was pretty much the biggest experiment that we're probably going to have in terms of a wave of revolutions uh, across that area using specifically this type of social media. Yeah, in Egypt in particular, after they the government fell, they raided some of the offices and they found just huge rooms full of equipment high-tech equipment bought from companies that, you know, private companies. They had bought it just to suppress opinion and shut down the internet. So, and then they promised that things were gonna change and now look at Egypt again, so, yeah. So we keep a web, we keep another website called Keep It On. <laughs> um, it's a huge campaign that we've launched to try to get these shutdowns to stop. Um, and just a few, because we have a latest news where we try to document the different shutdowns. 
Um, there was one in Argentina on September 2nd, so three days ago. Um, Gabon shut down its internet as election protests grow. Internet limited in Gabon during the election. Coalition calls out Bahrain for shutting down the internet. The Zambian government causes an internet shutdown. Um, sorry, my page keeps moving. Twitter and Facebook blocked in France. Um, Ghana again, Brazil, Syria, Ethiopia, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Brazil. The list goes on and on and on. And I've just gotten back to July, basically. So those are in the last two months shutdowns that we have seen occur. Um, and we know that we're not documenting all of them. Um, one of the issues, actually, another thing that got brought up, because as shutdowns continue, what people are increasingly doing are turning to VPNs to block their location um, so that they can route around some of the censorship that's occurring. The US government, under a rule that will go into effect on December 1st, in just a few months, um, unless Congress actively stops it, is going to use um, the use of a VPN as evidence to be able to basically forum shop to go to any court that they want to if they want to get access to your data. So if you are, if the US government is trying to, if the FBI is trying to get your data from your computer and they find out that you're using a VPN, right now they would have to go to the rules require them to go to the jurisdiction in which the search is to occur in order to get a judge to approve that order. Starting December 1st, if they can prove you're using a VPN, they're allowed to go to any judge in the entire US. They're probably going to go to the ones that, you know, favor issuing government court orders in order to be able to search your laptop. Um, and so VPNs are now becoming something that the government flags as being used by people they want to target more. Um, evidence, your use of a VPN is becoming evidence that maybe you're doing something wrong, um, which is, uh, and that's a trend we're also seeing is yeah. um, that if you use <clears throat> privacy enhancing tools and technologies that maybe you're covering something up and you can become a target. That's rule 41. Yeah, I believe it was part of the Snowden documents or maybe a WikiLeaks release, but <clears throat> the government was actually caught tracking users to certain websites like Tor to keep, kind of create a profile and associate that data with the people uh, on those websites. So. All right, so we have a question in the back, and then we'll go to the front, and then we'll go back over here. Yeah, I, I have two small questions. Um, uh, I was just wondering, uh, you guys mentioned that the that, – um, the government was uh, asking social media companies to take down posts or profiles of without, uh, them being forced to, but basically just telling them to. Um, what's the evidence behind that? Oh, it's there have been news stories about it. If you look up um, terms of service violations, I can probably point you to a few resources. Okay. I don't have them sitting in front of me okay. right now. I but have them it's sitting in front of me right oh. now, if you would like. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I can give you my hand, my sheet here, if you like. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, there's a bunch of links on here to examples. Um, so essentially, I can give some examples here real quick. So just days at, so after the or at the anniversary of Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, birth, I guess, they deleted Twitter accounts associated with giving out his pictures. And they weren't violent or violating any terms of service. That was purely a political thing. Um, a website that was expressing their opinion that a lot of GOP leaders are associated with the KKK, they shut that down. Um, the list goes on and on. There's probably about 10 or 15 here. Um, everything from gossip sites to uh, Tibetan monks setting themselves on fire. I mean, they could argue that that maybe is a legitimate shutdown. Um, but I'd be happy to give that to you after if you like. Yeah. Um, and then my second question is, um, what, what, do, what sources do you guys trust for news? <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Um, it's, I mean, it's a matter of how many people are reporting it. I always, always, and this is actually something journalists do far too often, go back to primary source documents. Right. And in, the good journalist will point you back to the primary source document that they're reporting on. Um, so you follow the chain of evidence back to determine. And a lot of times it's either a government policy document or a law or a draft law. Um, they are getting that information from somewhere. And so you can trace that information back. And I always go to look at the primary source um, because that's where you're going to find out every journalist is spinning 
something in some way. Sometimes and so, it's not intentional either. No. Sometimes it's just their own, they're trying to be unbiased and they just accidentally do it unintentionally. But I think, yeah, primary source documents are, are very important. Um, dare I say WikiLeaks, sometimes they're an important source on a lot of things. Um, but sometimes it's not possible to go to the primary source. So like in those circumstances, what I do will usually be to research the person who actually wrote the article and try to find out as much information on that person, you know, whether they're a trustworthy person, whether they have a history of just spewing government lines or whether they actually engage in a serious attempt to, you know, critique the officials or whatever the issue may be. Um, I mean, these are people, these aren't just words on the internet somewhere. You have to look at the person writing them. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, you know, just checking different perspectives as well. So if you see a story on Fox News, you know, you, you can go check it out on CNN or RT or what's another controversial one, Al Jazeera. So, I mean, I enjoy going out and seeing these different perspectives, different spins. The most important thing in my mind is just keeping that little bit of skepticism and realizing that everybody's kind of coming from a little bit of a bias, so. Oh. If I can piggyback on that, it's also if you're going to interrogate your news sources, which you should do, each one of them is going to have their own different biases depending on who's running them. Like um, Al Jazeera being based in the Gulf is going to be beholden to um, to who's running it in the Gulf. Like they weren't reporting on the unrest in Bahrain because they weren't allowed to, but they're really excellent on reporting on other things, um, especially farther out in the Middle East and um, issues in Europe, surprisingly enough. So, you know, I would. If I want to know what's going on in Bahrain with social unrest, I'm not going to trust Al Jazeera. Uh, but if I want to have some really good opinions on Brexit, I'm actually going to trust Al Jazeera. So that's also kind of related if you can't necessarily access primary sources, which I know I can't always. And you'll notice if you start shopping around for news, news sources that some, some will just not report on an issue at all. So you're not even able to compare their reporting. It's just omitted entirely. So that's another really interesting aspect of this whole debate. <clears throat> so uh, you uh, you said it's uh, Rule 41 about the VPNs. Do they put in some kind of proviso for corporate ones? Because every company I've worked for for the last 10 years has used them. Oh. So they're basically they're giving themselves an open access to pretty much, yeah. So they still have to get a court order. A court, they absolutely have to. It really, it opens up the venue for them to get that court order though. Um, and if you are trying to obfuscate your location, um, that is evidence that they do not have to go to a specific court. Um, they can go to any court that they want to. Um, there's a second part of it targeted bot nuts as well, um, but it's there's no extra provision. Okay, um, don't laugh, but uh, I was uh, perusing some conspiracy websites not so long ago, and I saw something about a rule that's coming down the pike from the UN having to do with the regulation of the internet and expression of uh, alternative ideas. Do you know anything about that? Um, no. Um, the UN has typically been very good. In fact, um, David Kay, who's the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, um, has a few very, very good reports um, out on different issues right now. And I highly recommend, if you're interested in how the UN is tackling freedom of expression, to look at his resources. He also has a Twitter profile. Um, very, very great um, resources there. His first report was on how encryption is necessary um, for freedom of expression and privacy and how it becomes a necessary enabling tool for that. Um, other than that, I would have, I don't know. I don't and what know. was the name of that gentleman? Uh, David K. David K. K-A-Y-E. Okay, so I don't have to be worried right now. <laughs> as far as I know, no. And now my colleague Peter, my sec, does all our UN facing work and I could ask him, but I, I feel like we would have been Pinged. You can be worried. I like conspiracy theories too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love Alex Jones. He's one of my favorites. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a good example. <laughs> um, I think what she might have been talking about was the, the plan to move control of the internet domains to, to international control instead of U.S. control. Um, yeah, I think that might have been it. Which, and they were concerned that international control would allow pressure to be put on the domain hosters for 
in the future being able to um, exert pressure over you know limiting access to information. Uh, my question: Are you familiar with the uh, the Philip DeFranco YouTube uh, situation? No. Uh, okay. It, the basic premise is that uh, they've told him that uh, they're demonetizing his news commentary because it contains controversial information. So some of his videos will not be allowed to be monetized, which is a, a <coughs> form of censorship because of YouTube's new terms of service. Hmm. Um, effectively, what they're saying is we don't like what you're saying, or it's it's not what we want to present. So we're not going to take it off the internet, but we are going to demonetize it. Um, in that type of coercive censorship, which is you know technically legal, I guess. Do you know of any tools that might be useful, like um, antitrust laws or electioneering, that would basically prevent what constitutes basically a general service provider like YouTube, who provides a platform to operate on, to prevent them from controlling the message uh, in, in influencing in, the, in that way? Do you know anything that, other than political action? Hmm. That's yeah. difficult because it's a private company, technically, and they sort of set the terms of their usage. Yeah. There are, there are things you could do, such as antitrust violations, if they had a specific I can tell you. You follow what I'm talking about. Or electioneering, if it was designed to influence the political actions, or follow Yeah, I kind of, I'm not sure if that would affect the election laws. Like, as far as, that, I don't know, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know of anything that would Impact effectively that. do that. Right. Um, YouTube has has policies about monetization of videos. Um, I have seen this now that when you explained it, I've kind of seen it scroll by, um, but I haven't read into it yet, so I don't know the exact situation. Um, but a lot of times it's just them trying to figure out how to apply their policies. Um, and that's why Larry's I think it's the practicing lawyer here. Al so. alter alternatives. <laughs> To YouTube, that's why I'm all for alternatives to the big, you know, monopolies like YouTube and whatnot. So um, I will say, there are fortunately right now there are still resources out there. It's not completely homogenized. So, and on the IANA transition, this is actually something Access Now has has heavily supported. Um, if that is something you guys are interested in, the the movement of ICANN out of the U.S. Um, there is a lot of misinformation being spread at the moment about what that does and what the repercussions are going to be. Um, we have a few blog posts about it on our website. I, if you want to check them out and read through those, um, again, not necessarily the issue that I work on at Access, um, but the resources are out there. And trying to figure out um, fact from fiction can be really difficult um, because the people spreading the misinformation are very, very loud about it. Um, but it is it is a very good thing. It is good for the internet. It is good for users of the internet, um, and it will be a positive move um, if Congress will actually vote to do it. To piggyback on that last question, um, in the U.S., when these takedown requests are given to social media sites based on their terms of service, where is that coming from? Is that FCC, FTC, NSA? Um, where's the where are those takedown requests coming from, and how does that impact? Um, how does that impact those those takedown requests? The implications of it. For the the terms of service violations, we don't know. Um, the other piece of the actual takedown oh. orders are reported on. But if you're just flagging like this is a terms of service violation, we don't know where those are coming from because they're not included in transparency reports. I believe YouTube has like a special page where you, you could submit some for like copyright and that kind of stuff. You can submit things like that, and I imagine they would have one for a general violation of their terms of service. Uh, as far as like the consequences, sometimes they'll just remove the video saying it's been removed, but other times they'll suspend the entire account. So uh, f the stories I've read, like if, they'll suspend, if they suspend your account, then you have to contact them and there's a little bit of a back and forth as far as trying to argue with them, like why your account shouldn't have been suspended. You know, so that's a big problem I think is, I mean, it, technically, legally, it's their site and they can pretty much do whatever they want as long as they don't violate, you know, any laws or something like that but yeah yeah okay this is on a, a little bit of a different topic uh, you brought up uh, like data localization legislation happening in Russia and it, I guess in an effort to control and get a better grip on what's going on with the different companies there so um, I've heard of something like this from a few of my clients actually not in Russia though but in Germany they um, um, so I, I work in high performance computing for doing people doing like scientific computations um, mm -hmm. and often I end up trying to sell cloud computing to some of these guys but 
they won't do it because they're like, okay, well, they make me do this little dance where all of our data has to be in Germany, and then we then we can send it over to the U.S. And it's just it's just such an overhead that they won't do it. Um, I looked at it and it's like there's not actually a law, but they said there will be a law soon. And now that you mention it, it makes me wonder: is like, are they is it are they actually using this as to strong arm companies in in Germany? Um, I can't remember the exact name of the the rule in play here. Um, you know, when I talk to the Europeans, they say it's because they don't trust NSA, and they don't so they don't want the data in the U.S. because they don't trust NSA. But now that you say this thing about Russia, it gives me this idea of possible different motives. So, what I believe you're talking about is the data protection rules in Europe, and so this is not necessarily manda mandatory data localization the way that I said that Russia is implementing it. Um, it's not mandatory, but uh, a lot of the companies yeah. foresee a very significant future cost of changing. So they basically have to do everything you know, this way. So essentially, um, Europe comes at your personal data very different way than the US does. And in Europe, data protection um, is a fundamental human right. And so you have certain right, Europeans have certain rights to the data that com companies collect about them that in the US we do not have to the data that companies collect about us. Um, what they have done is they have put in place rules that say if you're going to store this data outside of Europe, you have to give us an, the same level of protection that we would have if you were storing it in Europe. So there are additional steps that companies have to go through. They can store it outside of Europe, they just have to protect it in the same way and under the same rules as they would have to abide by in Europe. And so recently what happened, actually last year, is the Court of Justice of the European Union struck down the previous or a framework that was in place it was called safe harbor um, because what had ha what they said was the safe harbor agreement did not adequately protect against NSA and USA government access to Europeans data because of some of the programs that they were engaged in and so they struck down this agreement they said go back to the negotiating table come up with a better agreement that will protect our data against US government access the same way that you would have to do in the European Union and come back again. And so this year what they've done is they've approved an agreement called the Privacy Shield, um, which is the new safe harbor. It is a agreement that allows, if you abide by the requirements of the Privacy Shield as a US company, you can store Europeans' data in the United States. And it's because of the reasons you identified, it's really important that companies don't have to only store data in one area. Um, just because of normal operations of businesses. Um, but for Europeans, it's also really important to pr adequately protect data. Um, we have identified the problem with the privacy shield is it doesn't provide any extra protections for Europeans' data against government surveillance than the safe harbor did. So it actually didn't fix the problem that had been identified by the court. And the reason for that is the US government, under their official interpretation of their human rights obligations, does not recognize that people outside of the United States have human rights that need to be protected by the U.S. government. <laughs> um, so that they can, they don't have to protect Europeans' right to privacy so that they can access data much easier than if you are a U.S. person. They have to protect your right to privacy. And these aren't constitutional rights. There are constitutional rights that have a high standard and that there are human rights documents that the U.S. has signed on to with a different standard and they only apply those human rights to people in the United States as well. Um, so we believe it is highly likely that the privacy shield is going to get struck down as well. Um, it is a stopgap measure. If companies want to abide by the privacy shield, there are several of them online. There's a list of companies that say they are at the moment. Um, other companies have entered into specific agreements with the European government to say we will abide by these rules company by company easier for big companies to do that. They have a lot of resources. They can negotiate those agreements. Harder for small companies. Um, I think the saga on that will continue for at least a few years. Uh, I'll go back to your point about sort of violent online speech. Um, as from your example, the sort of executive branch either overreacts or doesn't care. Uh, the legislative branch is incapable of making any sort of coherent rules. And courts have generally taken a pass, at least at the Supreme Court level. How do you think that problem is going to shake out over the next 10 years? So, what type of violence? Be I'm sorry. 
Are you talking about like the the terrorism or CVE violent speech or like harassing speech? Uh, harassing violent speech like um, like Facebook, like Alanis or something like that. <laughs> um, I one thing that I think I think is I don't, I'm not for cyber bullying. I never really understood that because to me, bullying or cyber violence is sort of a contradiction. And this is probably controversial. A lot of people would disagree with this. But to me, when you post something online, um, you shouldn't feel threatened like physically, like an imminent sort of threat. It may be defamatory, but I don't see that as sort of like an area to legislate like violence or anything like that. Like there, there were some stories about people getting upset and they felt threatened because someone made a post and then they went to their house and the police arrested them or something for terroristic threat online or something. I mean, I'm against that kind of thing. I think it's like on, on the pathway towards censorship. But at the same time, if you're talking about, you know, actual f issues that come up, I mean, it's a possible lead for the police to investigate, but I don't think that should be grounds for arresting someone. Um, I'm also probably, I tend to be on the free speech side when it comes to just general violence. So as long as there's some kind of arguable purpose for it, instead of just a direct like incitement to blow up a building, uh, then I would probably tend to be on the side, you know, but that that's sort of a case by case Analysis because you have to look at how what the language says how likely it is that it's going to actually prompt someone to do it But a lot of the stuff that you see nowadays. is just you know controversial political opinions. It may be disgusting It may be you know abhorrent But you know, I would like to think that a lot of crazy stuff is covered by our Constitution <coughs> so um, it's a fine line. It's, it's going to be played out, you know, in the next couple of years for sure. Yeah. Does anybody here know Lori Drew? Has anybody here heard that name? So this case really <laughs> exemplifies why those laws are hard. Um, there is a woman in, I believe, the Midwest who her and her daughter created a fake profile of a young man and used it to create a relationship with one of her daughter's schoolmates. And then they outed and said this was a fake account and the other girl killed herself. It was a horribly sad story. And they tried to prosecute Lori Drew and her daughter under the CFAA by saying that by creating a fake profile, they violated the terms of service. And that was thrown out. That was a huge overinterpretation of the CFAA. Um, and so it was, it was right that it was thrown out, even though it was a tragic case. Computer Fraud and Abuse The Act. Computer Fraud yeah. and Abuse Act, I'm <clears throat> sorry, which says that you cannot use platforms beyond what you're allowed to, you cannot extend beyond the, the scope you're the permitted, scope of your authorized per thank to you. use it. Just, yeah. um, and so in, in the wake of that, in the wake of the case getting thrown out and everybody recognizing that this woman probably should have suffered some sort of consequences for her actions, they drafted a bunch of laws and all of those laws tried to say no cyberbullying. The problem was they applied to so much speech they applied to basically anything that you could say that could have a negative impact on somebody else. And they all got like routed as unconstitutional because they couldn't be put into place. Um, that's not saying that we shouldn't be trying to tackle this problem, but when you try to legislate what speech is good and what speech is bad, you oftentimes legis over-legislating. Um, and I think we've been dealing with that problem ever since. And we have yet to see a draft law that doesn't walk the line of unconstitutional. Um, and an infringement on too much speech. And so I think that's gonna be something that continues and as these harassment cases continue to become more high profile, we'll see it continue. Notably, we do have these criminal laws on the books though. Harassment is a crime, assault is a crime. Um, and so if police actually figured out how to deal with that in an internet context, we might be all a little bit better off um, because we have those standards in the real world. We just need to figure out how to work them in a digital dimension. Um, okay, going back to the VPN um, Rule 41, um, you sort of touched on this, but have companies at all been fighting against this? I, I, he had the same question I had, which was, I use a VPN for work like every day. Mm -hmm. How can companies be cool with the fact that even though they have to get a court order, that they can choose whatever court that they are? Like, I'm kind of surprised that you have don't have more of Silicon Valley being like, what the hell? They kind of snuck that one in, though. They, there was, it was a very quiet rule yeah. change. They were sneaking a substantive rule into a procedural, or a substantive change into a procedural rule. Um, and oddly enough, they, they switched the presumption. So typically, to legislate substance, you have to go to Congress and get a law passed. Because they snuck it into a procedural rule, 
it got approved by the Supreme Court and it went to Congress on the presumption that it would go into effect unless Congress passed something. Um, so now Congress has an affirmative duty to act. If anybody has paid attention to Congress recently, you know that getting Congress to act is <laughs> takes an act of God, um, essentially. Um, we are we're hoping that we see something to rebut this. There's a law in pending in Congress right now called the Stop Mass Hacking Act that is trying to take this rule change away. Um, we'll called? probably see something again next year. What's it called? The rule. This is, the rule is Rule 41 of the no, Federal no, no, the Rules stop. of Criminal Procedure. The law is the Stop Mass Hacking Act, Thank and you can remember that because the abbreviation is SMH, and in internet parlance, that means smack my head, um, <laughs> because that was how we all felt about this bill, about this rule. Okay. Thank you. Is that? I, I, yeah, I thought that was the last question, but yeah, Blair and I are we're a around bit over time. afterward. We're a little over time. Please feel free to come up and talk to either of us. Thank you all for coming out Thank on you your last much. day. We really appreciate it. Also, <laughs> please remember to rate us on the DragonCon <laughs> app. Thanks. <laughs>